Hi everyone, I'm Jared. I'm an account executive here at Gravity Payments. Um, if uh, the name Gravity Payments sounds familiar, uh, it might be from uh, a few years back when our CEO, uh, Dan Price, slashed his own million dollar salary in order to institute a $70,000 minimum wage at our company. Uh, since then, uh, we've, uh, we've been steadily growing and, and helping small to medium sized businesses uh, across the country uh, reduce the, the costs and headaches around their billing and their payment processing. And uh, that's what I'll be chatting uh, with you folks about today. I'm also joined by Zach Richardson, who is the founder of House Intelligence. Uh, Zach is an expert on business finance as well as search engine optimization and web development, uh, particularly in uh, the pool and spa service industry. So we asked Zach to join us for uh, today's webinar. Um, so I'll be showing you guys a quick demo of Gravity Payments and our core product and, and how it might be able to help you run your business and decrease your costs. But for now, uh, I'm gonna turn things over to Zach, who's gonna start off by uh, sharing a little bit of his knowledge about business finance, about search engine optimization, and about web development, as well as show you guys some tools on how to perform remote consultations and increase your website traffic. Uh, so Zach, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Jared. Yeah, as uh, Jared said, my name is Zach Richardson. I'm uh, kind of a jack of all trades or a Zach of all trades, if you will. Uh, most recently, I was the chief marketing officer at a venture-backed software company um, called PlexTrack that focused on cybersecurity. But I've also uh, been in positions related to accounting and finance, including a big four accounting firm earlier in my career. I've uh, done a lot of software development and software engineering. Um, and so I kind of bring a plethora of skills, but I really like to focus on how to build businesses and how to grow revenue and how to solve business problems. And I think that with what's happened with COVID-19, for example, has presented real challenges for businesses, particularly small and medium businesses. And with uh, another business that I've been involved in in the past, um, I became quite familiar with the pool and spa industry. And so in rolling out this new platform, House Intelligence, uh, wanted to take a particular focus on the pool and spa space and provide some, some information and some uh, hopefully helpful insights and introductions to tools that can help small businesses and, uh, and even pool and spa businesses make a transition to becoming more digital to eliminating some of the barriers that are inherent in that type of, of a business. And then also just providing some good business practices to um, further think about how to increase revenue and decrease costs. So what I've done here is pull up, uh, to get started, just pull up a, a simple P&L um, and demonstrate a way of thinking about revenue, thinking about costs that can help drive business decisions. And this is something that formally I learned in a cost accounting class that I took in university um, that focuses on making the transition from financial accounting into a little bit of cost accounting, which is really helpful for making decisions. So if we look at just the simple P&L that I've, I've put together here, we'll see revenue, obviously top line, um, and then the standard cost of revenue or cost of goods sold. Um, since a lot of pool and spa businesses are in both the product and services uh, revenue models, you know, cost of revenue may be a, a more appropriate descriptor, which ultimately, if you subtract your cost of revenue from the revenue, that gets you your gross margin or your gross profit, uh, which then you can use to compute your gross margin, effectively just your gross profit as a percentage of revenue. And then you go through and uh, deduct your operating expenses. If you have depreciation on fixed assets or interest on, on loans or notes from a bank, you, did, you deduct those things out and then you, you get your net income. And this is a standard P&L that someone like your bookkeeper or your accountant uh, may present you with. And one thing that I wanted to demonstrate, and this will lead into what Jared will speak to later in terms of what gravity can potentially do from a payment processing standpoint and some of the costs it can eliminate is to think about costs, not just in terms of 
calculating margin, for example, not just in terms of understanding what's your gross profit, what's your uh, net, you know, what's your net profit, what, what are your margins with respect to those, but thinking about, okay, in this time of COVID, in this time of uncertainty, how might we look at our financials in a way that helps us identify what things we can cut, how much we can cut, how that might affect revenue, and so on and so forth. And so in transitioning from a financial um, understanding, which again is kind of the standard way in which accountants may report your financial performance, what we can do is we can look at our expenses and we can break them out in terms of fixed and variable costs. And I created just a little, a little um, categorization table that if we look at those expenses we had in our financial statement, things like rent, utilities, so on and so forth, in our financial statements, in our, you know, in our financial form of the P&L, they may just go under operating expense or cost of revenue, so on and so forth. And they don't necessarily explain to us or tell us, well, how much of that can I reduce and what might that effect be on my bottom line? And so if instead of categorizing them under those traditional financial categories, we instead just break them up in terms of fixed or variable, meaning if I have rent to pay, I can't change the amount of my rent. Presumably, I can't change the amount of my rent in the short term. But for example, my utility bill, I may be able to change that by increasing or decreasing my cost of, or my consumption of utilities. So fixed costs are simply costs that cannot be changed in the short term, whereas variable costs are costs that can be changed in a lot of times they're directly proportional to consumption, things like gas or advertising or, um, you know, in the pool and spa space as pool pros, if you commission or if you compensate um, some of your, some of your uh, pool pros based on the routes that they have and the income that those routes generate, you know, what you pay your pool pros and what, you're, what you pay your team may be um, categorized as a variable cost. And then ultimately what we can do is create a slightly different um, income statement where instead of looking at you know, operating costs or gross margin, we simplify it quite a bit down to look at here's my revenue, which stays the same, but now here's my variable costs. And here are the things that I can actually affect in the short term in order to potentially increase my profitability and decrease my costs. And ultimately, when we, when we subtract variable costs from revenue, that gives us what's called our contribution. And our contribution is the amount of revenue available to us to cover our fixed costs. So in all the, in all the businesses that I've been involved with, I've always put together contribution income statements because what I've found is that they are far more effective and helpful in terms of making day-to-day -day decisions. And they allow me to look at things like my advertising budget and say, okay, what do I actually think my advertising is going to um, generate in terms of revenue? And I can start to play with correlations, play with scenarios, and then directly see how my contribution is affected by those things so that I can better plan and prepare to cover my fixed costs. And then obviously from there, take a look at what's the ultimate effect on my net income. So this is, you know, this, this spreadsheet is something that I'm happy to share uh, in our follow-up materials, but I just wanted to kind of set that, that seed because like I said, Jared's going to talk about, you know, from a, from a variable cost perspective in terms of processing payments later, um, how those things might be positively improved through a solution like gravity payments. But fundamentally what I want to touch on today um, and what I'm really excited to share are the software and digital tools that I think are helpful and I think are worth exploring in terms of really increasing um, revenue amid this shift to a digitized and remote environment. And the first thing that I want to talk about is website development. And I want to hopefully, the goal of this is to hopefully uh, give a sense of confidence that even as a small business owner who may have no formal training or or background in website development, you can put together a very polished, very professional website with minimal work and without needing to know technical things. Um, you, hear of, you hear of platforms like 
um, Squarespace or Wix, which are fine. I'm a big proponent of WordPress because it's such a more powerful platform to build websites with. So that's what I'm going to introduce to you guys today. And there are a lot of different hosting solutions for WordPress, but the one that I would recommend is called WP Engine. And the reason I would recommend it is it's both I found to be the most high performance, much more high performance than HostGator or uh, Bluehost or some of the others. It is a little bit more expensive than them, but by far the best customer service and support I've ever experienced. I mean, it is a very, in terms of, in terms of WordPress hosting site, they are just on top of it. They are extremely helpful and they will guide you through um, whatever you need help with in terms of managing your, your WordPress hosting and instance uh, setup. And so I believe pricing starts at about 30 bucks a month. Um, but, but again, their solution is complete both from the hosting and from the servicing standpoint. And we're not going to walk through how to actually instantiate a WordPress site. Um, again, if you sign up for an account, they can help you get that set up and walk you through that. But what I want to talk about primarily are some design patterns. And then once you have your WordPress site set up and ready to uh, actually start creating content and creating a website, um, what does that process look like? And what are the best practices that you can adopt to make sure that you create a site that looks good? It's not, you know, it doesn't need to look like it's perfectly professionally done, but what are some design patterns you can adopt that professionals use to make it look like your brand, you know, to really just enhance your brand and really communicate trust to your customers that, that it's a, that you're a business, you're a provider that, that is trustworthy and knows what they're doing um, and is attractive. So the first thing that I wanted to touch on is color schemes and Google put together through a lot of time and effort, a lot of research, a design pattern for digital interfaces called material design, which you can find at material IO. And there's a ton of information, a lot of theory, a lot of, a lot of things on here. Um, if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of design theory, this is the, this is the place to go, I believe. But what I wanted to point out was under the color uh, section, their color system, they provide a suite of hex codes, which are just color codes um, that their system employs and that they recommend for, for using within any digital interface. And these are the very colors that I use when I, when I build websites. My preference, as you'll see when I show you the actual the actual little demo site that I've put together. I'm a big fan of blue and orange, um, not just because I'm a Boise State Bronco <laughs> and a Denver, a Denver native, so a Denver Bronco fan as well, but, um, but they really complement each other well. Um, and that's ultimately what you wanna go for. There's a, there's a very common theme in user interface design that you want your primary kind of backgrounds and, and interfaces to be generally cool colored. So blues, greens, purples, things like that. And then you want your call to actions to be warm colored to stand out um, amidst that, that cool background. So reds, yellows, oranges. And again, I, I, I always kind of find myself gravitating toward the blue and orange juxtaposition. Um, but this is a great, this is a great resource in terms of identifying colors that you might want to use for your, for your website, for your brand. Um, and then you can simply just copy and paste them into your WordPress editor, into your, uh, you know, page builder as you, as you'd like. Um, so let me go ahead and jump to the little demo, uh, site that I've put together just real quickly to show you, you know, how I create something like this. So, um, just created a, a pretty generic looking kind of pool pro site. But what I wanted to highlight were some of the key design patterns that I implemented that are, um, you know, they're, they're very standard. They're very kind of baseline, but I believe that you kind of have to build from that foundation and then you can take liberties as you see fit. So very common pattern of websites is to have what's called a hero section as your, uh, as your primary section, which is like a big, vibrant, you know, oftentimes a picture or video, and then having calls to action. 
Um, this pattern is very common where you have a primary call to action and then you have a secondary call to action with complementary color schemes like that. Um, and then just a value, pro you know, your clear value proposition. Uh, sometimes you might put a little sub description beneath it. A very common and go-to design pattern is this style where you have a body of text with a call to action that sits next to some video or some piece of media, uh, photo, whatever it might be, illustration, but where you have a, you know, a, a headline and then a longer description followed by a call to action. You see these types of design patterns standard on numerous websites, um, especially professionally built ones because they're effective, they're clean, they look good, um, and they, they really communicate well to, to the viewer. You also see very commonly these design patterns where you have what are called cards um, or just they can be flat sections as well, but I really like the card feel and that's a very kind of material design pattern where you kind of want your digital interface and your digital media to emulate real world kind of paper type feel. Um, and then you have a call to action at the bottom and again you see how the text you know, the text is cool, the, the um, description, the body paragraphs is, you know, standard dark gray or even black text. And then the call to action kind of pops out um, as that lighter color. And then you have the juxtaposing or the, the um, reversed version of that same side-by-side -side content with media there. So these design patterns are really easy to implement. They're very safe. They're very, you know, just don't shoot yourself in the foot type of uh, simplistic where they look professional, um, they stand out to the user, they communicate clearly. Uh, they're very easy to consume as the user. And then at your footer, you know, you have, it's very common to have uh, your copyright. Um, in this case, because of the simple theme I'm using, it has, you know, go to the top of the page, a lot of times you'll put your social media accounts uh, with the icons down here as well. Um, I'll talk about this guy, uh, the schedule powered by Calendly in a little bit. Calendly is a very powerful uh, and convenient tool to use to be able to allow people that visit your website to automatically schedule an appointment with you by integrating with your Google Calendar so that you can just automatically receive appointments without any intervention from an assistant or anything like that. But without further ado, I want to jump into how to actually edit and update some content on the website and show you how easy it is to do. Because with WordPress, a common conception that I've found is that people think that WordPress is this very complex, you know, you got to be a web developer in order to use it. And you can definitely get into some complex stuff in WordPress. I mean, you can get into actually writing code. But there's been a lot of tooling created by the open source community around WordPress that makes it every bit, I believe, every bit as easy to use as a Wix or as a Squarespace, but having a lot more power. And the reason that WordPress is so much more powerful than Wix or Squarespace is because it's open source. And therefore, you have a huge community of developers that build things called plugins, which I'll show you a couple of my favorite plugins to use. Uh, but you have this huge open source community of contributors of plugins and additional tools that you just don't get with a Wix or a Squarespace simply because they haven't been around nearly as long as WordPress. I mean, I think it's something on the order of 25% of websites are powered by WordPress. So it's a huge community. And there's a lot of tools that have been created to help web developers and web designers to continue to, to build things. And to that end, what page builder you use is really important. And my, my go-to, my favorite, is this guy called Elementor. And Elementor, will will dig into it a little bit, but you see that Elementor allows you to just WYSIWYG, uh, add content, drag and drop um, things into your website and do a whole bunch of stuff without having to write any code, without any sort of uh, compilation process, it's all WYSIWYG, you can, you know, you can see it, you can uh, manipulate it as you will. And it is very powerful because of the number of widgets that they have and the functionality of widgets, which are those little drag and drop utilities that allow you to construct your, um, to construct your web page. So the way that 
element or looks in the actual page is when you're in your WordPress admin. And again, we're not gonna cover kind of the WordPress setup, but once you have it set up, once you're able to edit it, um, once you've added the Elementor plugin, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about adding plugins, you're able to just, from, from a page on your website, just click Edit with Elementor. <clears throat> and it reloads the page in an interface where you have the Elementor editor over on the left, and then you have the ability to just alter the appearance of things by clicking into items. And it might be a little slow because I'm sharing my screen. So hopefully this, uh, interesting. There we go. I guess I can edit the button, but not the, not the text, huh? Um, so yeah, so, so for example, this is a button that I dragged and drop. And the way that I did that was just by, you know, if I want to add a button, I can just simply drag and drop a button down there. I can choose how I want it to be aligned, you know, left, center, right, justified, um, however I want. I can edit the text of the button. I can add a link if I want, um, you know, and, and then it has a bunch of other configurations that you can do. You can, you know, if you want to add, for example, if we wanted it to be raised a little bit, we could go to the box shadow and we could add some blur to this guy or we could add some vertical or some uh, horizontal alignment. So we could do, you know, something like adding 10 and 10 and then it looks like it pops out a little bit, but there's a lot of flexibility that you can have with the elements and uh, the styling capabilities. And then if you want, you know, to add things like margins. So for example, if you want there to be a little bit of space between the button um, and the content above it, you can add some margin. And it does it like that. So everything is WYSIWYG and you can immediately see the effects of your edits on the page itself. And so again, hopefully you see how, I mean, this is very similar to like a Wix or a Squarespace and it's, um, you know, it does take time. It does. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend that you're going to, you know, it's, it's something where it's just super intuitive and, and it's, you know, like any tool, it takes time to get familiar with. Um, but it's one of those things that if you play with it, if you, if you take time to learn it, um, you can, you can build out some pretty cool interfaces and certainly build out, um, a full fledged site for your, for your business. Um, without needing to pay thousands of dollars on a web developer, without needing to to um, dive in or learn complex technology, it's you know it it, it very much, in my opinion, is uh, kind of like if you can if you can do WordPress, you know, or I'm sorry, if you can do PowerPoint, if you're comfortable with a tool like PowerPoint, um, then something like Elementor, while there is a little bit more functionality and more to learn, it's you know it's it's obtainable and you can by following those design patterns and learning from best practices and, you know, things like this, um, you can, you can certainly build a website for your business that stands out and that, and that grabs the attention of your customers. Um, one thing I'll, one other thing I'll point out about this is the, the background capabilities. So for example, this background image with the text on top of it, the way that I do that is I create a new section and I can select what kind of content structure I want for that section. So in this case, I just selected the simplest, which is to have uh, a single column of content within this row. And then once I do that, I can edit the actual row of, of, uh, of content and throw under style just a background image. Um, which I chose this, this kind of generic pool looking image. So um, that is, you know, and, and obviously if you get, if you decide to pursue playing around with Elementor and, and building a website of your own, there's a lot of resources around Elementor. It's an extremely popular page builder. And so if you go on YouTube um, or if you Google, you know, how do I do this in, in Elementor, there's a lot of resources and a very broad community of, of people to help answer those questions. So the next thing I want to do is dive into the, um, 
the the admin of WordPress, which is when you think of WordPress and when you see uh, images of WordPress, this is typically what you see. Um, and I want to talk about plugins, which are the extensions you can add into your WordPress setup in order to get more functionality and, and add some tooling around it. So this is the WordPress admin. And from here, you can add pages. Um, right now, I just have that one home page. I could add a new page, name it whatever I want, um, and go from there. And I can also add plugins. And the Elementor Builder is simply a plugin that I added. And a plugin that I always add to my WordPress websites is something called Yoast SEO. Because now getting into, all right, we have our, work, we have our website that is designed the way that we want it. Now we want to try and improve our performance on organic Google search, right? So there's two fundamental components of SEO. And I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity in the past to work with um, some very talented SEO guys, including one guy who's uh, probably one of the top five SEOs in the world. He does consulting for, uh, he was the chief search officer actually for both about.com in the 90s and it got acquired by New York Times and he ended up becoming the chief search officer for all of New York Times portfolio companies until he spun off his own consulting firm. And now he consults for quite literally, I think just about any major publication you can think of. Uh, this guy's the guy that they call when they need to figure out how to improve their SEO. So um, I, I bring that up because uh, what I'm, what I'm sharing with you is very, very much best practices in terms of how to, uh, optimize your search performance and how to think about content and think about search to really um, to really get yourself and position yourself to appear on Google Google search results. And so the go-to tool for any uh, SEO is um, a tool called Yoast SEO, which I've already installed, as you see, and. Once you've installed it, just by clicking install now and then activate, you'll have this SEO uh, little menu item in the bottom left of your, of your WordPress panel. And the way that that comes through and the way that it becomes a highly effective tool on your website is within your pages, you're able to see... Um, you're able to see kind of suggestions and improvements you can make based on Yoast's analysis of your page content. So if I put in that I want this page to really focus on the keyword pool pro, Yoast has this little uh, guide that shows you all the things you can do in order to improve your S, your what's called on-page SEO performance. And on-page just means the content itself. You'll hear a lot of SEOs talk about on-page versus off-page SEO. And I'll talk about off-page SEO in a second. But on-page is fundamentally, how is the content constructed on your page itself? Like the in terms of how many times you use the keyword, in terms of uh, making sure that you're, you're using kind of the right uh, HTML tags, which Elementor handles that automagi automatically for you. And in terms of things like your readability, which is making sure that you're not discussing something at too complex of or too sophisticated of a manner so that people can actually read it and understand it and it's valuable for, for your audience. So Yoast SEO, we won't get into too much about like how to go about fixing all these things, but it's pretty descriptive in terms of, you know, what it suggests. For example, one of the things it looks at is key phrase density. And what it's saying is that the term pool pro isn't found on this page. So if I want to improve my keyword density, obviously I need to add in the term pool pro a few more times so that when Google's bot comes by and reads that page, it sees, Oh, this page is about pool pros. And, um, and it may start to index based on 
or it may index it based on on that phrase as well as the other phrases that it just looks at. So um, Yoast is very helpful in terms of constructing the content itself on the page, especially the written content to be conducive to Google picking it up and displaying it in its search results. Um, now the other type of SEO is off-page SEO. And the most important form of off-page SEO is still backlinks, which is other websites linking back to your website because Google looks at backlinks as effectively a vote of confidence or a vote of trust that this is a trustworthy website because other websites reference it. And there's a tool called SEMrush, which is, I think, probably by far the most powerful tool in terms of doing research on what sorts of keywords and what's, what website, what sorts of keywords you might write content about and what websites you're competing with and what websites you may want to try and get backlinks from. So SEMrush is a very comprehensive suite of tools and we're not going to get into everything. But what I did want to show you is the organic research tool because it basically gives you insight into both your website as well as other people and other competitor websites. Um, so if I type in something like, and I'll just show you very, very quickly, uh, <clears throat> what this report looks like. You can run a report on any domain and you know, for domains that don't have a lot of, a lot of data, it may show that it doesn't have data, but what it shows is how traffic flows over time. What it shows is the top keywords that get ranked for by that website or that that website's ranking for. Um, and it shows, you know, the pages within that website, it shows which pages uh, receive the most traffic. So it provides just a lot of analytics about your website, but more powerfully about your competitor's website. So you can start to map kind of, all right, for the competing, for the competing businesses in my area or the competing, uh, the competing topics that I like to talk about and present on my website, how might I more strategically go about creating content and generating backlinks, reaching out to other blogs, reaching out to other sites that may link back to me in order to increase my trustworthiness and performance on Google. So it's a really powerful tool. Again, takes, you know, there's, there's so much more to it than we can get into in just this brief webinar, but I would really encourage you to, to play around with it. And they have a free tier where you can do, I think, 10 queries a day for free to just kind of get into it and get acclimated with, with it. So going back, uh, the final thing I wanted to show you from the website perspective is um, this schedule, you know, powered by Calendly scheduler. And Calendly is, they have a very generous free tier. It's just Calendly.com. Calendly and they allow you to create, uh, recur or create um, calendar invites that people can schedule an appointment with you with absolutely zero touch. So in order to do that, you just simply create a, a free account. And after you've created a free account, you can set up whatever types of appointments you want. And um, once you've set up the appointments that you want to allow people to schedule with you, you do a little add to website and you can decide how you want it presented on your website. And then from there, all you do is add it into your, uh, you can add it in via an HTML tag in your, in your uh, Elementor page builder, which is I believe how I did it here. You can also do it through a header on the, uh, WordPress admin itself, which is a little bit more advanced, but ultimately the net result is that people can click on this schedule and it pops up the ability to schedule, you know, an appointment with you. And if you integrate with your Google calendar calendar through Calendly, it keeps your schedule up to date in real time. So if I'm a user that comes to your website, if I'm a pool owner that wants to schedule 
you know, pool maintenance and I click on, okay, I want it for today. It automatically has your open availability um, based on your integration with your calendar. So it handles all that for you, zero touch, and it's, it's really convenient. And it makes it so that, you know, you can effectively drive traffic or uh, drive appointments automatically and you just receive a notification when someone creates an appointment so it's super powerful and super helpful for just really eliminating friction in terms of allowing your customers or potential customers to to schedule appointments with you from a servicing standpoint um that's calendly the last thing in terms of the website that i wanted to touch on actually so i guess there's two more things um I wanted to touch on the ability to handle uh, subscriptions, but I think Jared will really touch on that with, with uh, his demo of gravity payments. So we're going, to, um, we're going to not worry about that right now since we're running a little bit short on time. And I wanted to touch finally on Google Analytics. And Google Analytics is the go-to analytics platform for understanding the traffic that flows to your website. Where do they come from? What do they do once they're on your website? So on and so forth. And Google has a very helpful demo account, which I can include a link to um, in the follow-up to this webinar, where you can play around with Google Analytics and get familiar with the tools and reports because once you first put Google Analytics on your site, you know, you're not going to have a lot, of, a lot of data to play around with, but it's helpful to become acclimated with, with the reports so that as you generate data from people visiting your website, you're able to kind of make sense of the data. So there's a few reports that I really um, spend most of my time in, which is in audience, um, I really look at the overview and I really want to understand just the general makeup of my users so that I know who I'm catering to. I want to understand, are they new? Are they returning? Um, I want to understand, you know, over time, how do my users flow? I want to understand um, things like where they're coming from, uh, what countries are they in? I want to understand, you know, their locale. I want to understand, especially are they, are they visiting it on mobile um, versus, uh, desk, desktop and you know just all those things um, you can also within your audience you can look at things like age and gender which is extremely helpful um, if you're you know I think from the from the pool platform pool uh, app that I that I I've co-owned with others in the past you know we kind of had a very male dominant audience and so that was helpful in terms of understanding what kind of content we might want to produce that appeals more to that demographic uh, and drive traffic more there. Um, but the other thing that you can do that's extremely powerful is you can use what are called UTM codes to understand, better understand the sources that drive traffic to your website. So if you're sharing content on Facebook, if you're sharing content on Instagram or through other partner, uh, partner channels, you can tag them with UTM codes and then see those users come through your website and see how they behave. So right here you see, you know, a lot of uh, Google organic and direct are two default ones where if they come through just through uh, organic search, it'll be attributed to this. If they come through by actually typing in your URL into their browser, it'll show up as this. But then you see some of these additional things like uh, DFA forward slash CPM which this is generated from a UTM code. And all a UTM code is, is just a set of parameters that by going to Google's developer uh, campaign URL builder, you can specify, okay, this is, the, this is the URL I want them to visit, but I wanna tag it with certain parameters so that in analytics, I know where these users are coming from specifically. And then when you share that, you share that entire link that it auto generates, which you can shorten um, through Bitly, which I won't do that, but you can shorten into a, into a shortened link so it doesn't look so bulky. But ultimately what it does is analytics looks at these parameters and it uses those parameters in order to generate 
the, the source that it comes through. So that way you can get a more granular understanding of where traffic is coming as opposed to just, oh, it came from, you know, it came from search or it came from, um, you know, Facebook. It allows you to actually track and reconcile if you're running Facebook ads or if you're running ads on Google AdWords, it allows you to really, really specify those things so that you can start to um, analyze a return on investment of your marketing activities. You can start to, gen you can start to see kind of how your different marketing activities are actually paying off in terms of traffic to your website. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is social media. Now I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, what your social media strategy ought to be, but I wanted to talk about the importance, especially of video in the pool space. And as you know, pool and spa professionals and service providers, how powerful video can be in terms of engaging your customers, creating an audience and expanding your reach beyond even just your locale, but to a broader range of potential customers and becoming a trustworthy figure within the industry. And the tool that I like to use for, uh, for video um, production is this tool called Camtasia by TechSmith. And again, not going to get into it today, but it looks like this when you're actually in, you know, in the, um, in the tool and it's really intuitive. I've used other tools like Adobe Premiere Pro, which is very, very powerful, but it's also a lot more complex. Camtasia is very easy to, to learn and very easy to edit videos. And so I would highly recommend it if you get into producing videos and sharing those through your social platforms. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about is especially Instagram and the power that Instagram can play in terms of reaching, um, you know, reaching a broader audience, but especially reaching a local audience and a specific strategy for, um, for reaching local consumers in ways that I would anticipate a lot of your competitors probably aren't utilizing. And that is through thing that is through reaching out to people called uh, micro influencers. So one of my best friends is a guy named David McKenzie. He's local here in Boise and he is a perfect example of what I would describe as a local micro influencer. He's, he's a former Boise state football player. Uh, he's got about 20,000 followers and he does a lot of work with local businesses. For example, um, a local realty group had him speak at one of their events. Uh, he, he hosts the Miss Idaho competition, uh, Miss Idaho um, event each year. He does a lot of different things. And he's one of these guys that whatever, you know, whatever geographic demo uh, location you're in, you'll know a lot of people like this as well, or you can find them by looking through kind of posts um, within your city of people with, you want to look, I mean, the, the sweet spot is about 10 to 30,000 followers uh, with kind of a local focus. And you can engage them to be advocates and to be promoters of your brand, even be, you know, do video and things like that. And it's a great channel and a, and a for the most part, pretty um, efficient and low cost channel. I mean, I think David will post, you know, maybe three posts for a few hundred bucks to be able to um, reach your local audience and engage them about your brand. And it's a, it's, again, I found it to be a lot more efficient than doing things like Google AdWords or Facebook ads. Those have just become so competitive and, and so expensive. Whereas going directly to kind of local micro influencers through Instagram and establishing trust through a already trusted authority um, is, is very, very powerful. And I've just seen tremendous return on investment from brands that have done it. So I wanted to kind of uh, especially highlight that um, and encourage you to get on Instagram and look for those local influencers that you might be able to collaborate with um, and, and use to drive more, more people to you. So with that, I know I went a little bit over time, but uh, happy to answer any questions in the Q and A as, um, as Jared talks about how gravity payments can really help your business, uh, reduce, reduce, um, costs from chargebacks and really enhance your payment processing, uh, for your pool and spa business. So I will go ahead and, um, 
stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Zach. That was uh, that was extraordinarily helpful. I know um, before you started your presentation, I was a lot more intimidated by using a, a website editor like WordPress. Um, now, after uh, after checking that out, I uh, I feel like I could actually do that myself. Um, so that's great. Really, thank you for doing that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, quickly just go through a tool that we have at Gravity Payments. It's our sort of core virtual terminal product. Um, it's called Gravity Link, and uh, it looks like this. So uh, essentially, you know, once you've got all of your customers pouring in, thanks to your uh, you know gorgeous new WordPress site and your great search engine optimization and social media presence, um, this is a way that uh, you can use a variety of different tools to uh, charge your customers and get paid in a quick, safe, seamless manner, um, and set up recurring billing as well as do invoices. So I'm gonna start with um, just the most basic, um, simple charge. Um, there's a lot of uh, fields on here that aren't uh, required, so you can be as um, just uh, quick as putting in a cardholder name, the amount to charge them, the credit card information here. Um, so I'm going to run just a quick, uh, let's say, five dollar transaction for um, for our purposes here. Going to put in an address. Uh, Going to put in a code, and then uh, just a quick invoice number if I have one. A quick description if I have one, and go ahead and send that. All right, I think I'm ready to process that charge. Oops. <laughs> okay, so um, it declined because it's not a real charge. But um, uh, once that is finished, uh, you'll receive an email with the receipt if you choose. Uh, your customer will receive an email with the receipt if you choose. And uh, that's really all there is to it, like on the most basic level just manually entering a card. Um, this can be accessed via the web like we're doing now, um, or it can also um, it can also be accessed uh, via your iPhone or iPad or Android tablet or Android phone as well. Um, so that is just kind of the most basic, um, like uh, just put in the card information and go. Um, so now, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to uh, move on to a uh, kind of a more detailed uh, version of, of uh, Gravity Link. So uh, on the new order screen here, we're going to have the opportunity to put in more details about our customer, as well as save that customer profile for later so that you can um, go ahead and um, charge them on a uh, sort of ongoing basis for your, for your pool route, for instance. So um, this first column here is, is order for anything that's particular about this. Order, you can add your invoice number if you have an invoice. Same with a PO number. Uh, and you can choose to have line items or not have line items. But for this, in this scenario, let's do line items here. So we're going to do a pool route. Say that uh, costs one hundred and twenty-five dollars, and we're going to go ahead and charge them for four of those right off the bat. Um, you can add tax if you have local tax. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can add it here. Um, if you can, if you preordained the amount of tax to add, that's a percentage or a flat. Amount per transaction that'll automatically show up when you click tax. And now we're going to add a customer. Going to add Fred Flintstone from 12345 Bedrock Way in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, and add an email here. And then down at the bottom, uh, if you, this is going to be your recurring customer that you want to be able to charge more quickly next time you're going to go ahead and check save the customer and the provided details into the customer database. Um, that way uh, you'll have a, a new customer that you can then bill on an ongoing basis if you'd like. 
uh, when I hit next, it's going to go to the payment screen. Um, we're going to press credit and put in credit card number uh, and just the same basic information as before. So, um, so you can see this a little bit more involved than just the, the basic payment from the beginning. Uh, but this will give you the opportunity to save the customer's credit card details as well as their basic information so that you can charge them later on. Um, it should be said that uh, although you're, you're, te you're technically you know, saving credit card details, uh, you're not actually saving the entire number. Like you won't have your customer's actual credit card number saved anywhere on your computer or your phone or anything like that. Uh, the information is encrypted and it's uh, tokenized or scrambled so that only our system is actually storing it uh, remotely and only our system can actually use the information. So uh, it can't be stolen, uh, it can't be accessed by anyone. Uh, it can only be used uh, by Gravity to run those credit cards. Got a couple questions coming in. I'll be able to answer those in just a moment. Thank you. Now next, uh, we're going to go uh, to our customer screen. So essentially, if you wanted to add a customer or uh, bill a customer that you've already added, uh, we're going to start here and I'll show you how to create a recurring payment. So if you've got folks that pay you each month or maybe bi-weekly for pool service, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to set that up so it happens automatically and you don't have to worry about it. So we're going to go ahead and add a customer. Uh, let's add Fred Flintstone again. Uh, all of these uh, fields are actually um, optional, so you don't have to put in a you know, phone number if you don't have it, or a, a company if they're not from a company or, any, or a website or anything like that. I would encourage you to put an email just so that they uh, get their receipt and uh, they, uh, they realize you know, where that charge is coming from every two weeks or every month or however you set it up. Uh, we're going to add now a credit card. that. Now that we've got a credit card saved for our customer, Fred Flintstone here, we're going to now be able to add a billing schedule. So this is where you can um, add a payment that's going to happen um, every, every week, every month, every uh, two weeks, every three weeks, uh, whatever you need in that regard. Choose this as the default method. And we're going to save. Now that we've got a customer here, should be able to add a billing schedule. Great. So, right now there's no billing schedules. If there were, um, you get some information about that, and I'll show you that in just a moment here. So, uh, first, we're going to put in an amount. So, however much we want them to be charged every week or every two weeks or every month. $125, just pretending that's the, uh, the cost of our, uh, of, our, of our pool route. And then we're going to add uh, a schedule. So uh, first, we're going to pick the starting date. So if that's today, great. If that's maybe the first of next month, uh, we can go with that. So we'll just go ahead and choose uh, June 1st as the starting date. Uh, now we're going to choose a frequency, either uh, weekly, monthly, or yearly. Uh, once we choose one of these frequencies, we're going to be able to actually drill down and add some more detail to it. But let's just say monthly for now. So now we're working with a calendar month. Um, if we wanted to do a total number of payments and make it automatically stop after that, we can. So if you have a six-month contract or a year contract, we can do the you know a uh, a finite number of payments. Uh, for this example, we're just going to leave it blank, and that will uh, basically make it go indefinitely. So we're going to say uh, uh, every month on the first of the month, uh, they're going to be charged $125. Uh, we can add another, another rule. So we can say on the first Sunday or um, on the uh, first Tuesday, uh, if it's a weekday, uh, we can add the rules there. Um, but for now, let's just say uh, we're going to do 
a $125 charge on uh, the first of every month. We'll get a, uh, a detailed uh, schedule here. So uh, as you can see on June 1st, they're gonna be charged $125 and then another $125 on uh, July 1st, then August 1st and so on. And then it gives you the total they've been charged uh, in general. So it's adding $125. It's not charging them 250 this time then 375 this time. It's just showing you what the total you've collected from that customer over time is based on those $125 payments. Uh, so it looks like we're ready to, uh, to add this. And great, so now this billing schedule is active and it's gonna tell us right here that the next payment is happening on June 1st for $125 and it's gonna happen every month on the first day of the month in the amount of $125 for an indefinite period of time until you go in and change this or um, remove it or uh, alter it in some way. It's gonna just go like clockwork by that amount. So we'll go ahead and save and we're ready to go knowing that uh, Fred Flintstone is being charged for his pool service uh, every first of the month for $125. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you, um, I know we're going a little bit over time, is just how to send a quick invoice. So if you're doing a, um, like a larger maintenance job or construction job uh, or other service job that's maybe like a one-time larger payment, you might uh, want to send the customer an invoice for it. Uh, so it's uh, it's very simple. We're going to go ahead and add a new one. Uh, your business information and uh, your logo, if you add one, will already be up here in the top corner. So you just have to fill in a customer. But let's say we just want to fill fill good old Fred Flintstone. We can just go ahead and pull up his customer information already here, or we can go line by line and just add it for any new customers or kind of one off. So we're just going to go ahead and put in Fred Flintstone. His information shows up here. Um, again, we can add line items if we want to. So we'll go ahead and put in uh, pool service. Maybe this one is for $500. And uh, we're gonna say there's no tax on this. Maybe a quick invoice note. Thank you for using pool pros. And uh, we can put in an invoice number here if we want. PO number if we have one. Uh, the, today's date will automatically be there, but you can change that. And if you want to put a due date uh, as well. So let's say there's net 30 terms. Uh, the due date is 6 27 2020. So we'll give them a month pay. Um, we can send off that $500 invoice. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. Great, it's been created. Now we're gonna hit send and that'll email it. In just a moment, I'll get, I'll show you what it looks like uh, in, our, uh, in our email here. So in the meantime, uh, we've gotten uh, a receipt from that transaction we initially ran. So this is what your, uh, your receipts will look like. Uh, you can have a logo on here as well. Um, say, you know, you've been charged by your name of your company and all the information about, about that particular, um, that particular transaction. Uh, you can also have the same receipt sent along to you as well. So now here's the invoice that we've received. Hello, Fred Flintstone, you've received an invoice from Gravity Payments. Here's the total. Um, we can go ahead and see like this basic information when it's due, the amount and who it was sent from. We can view that invoice. And uh, from here, we can download it as a PDF. So if we wanted to have an invoice for our records or our customer's records, here's uh, just kind of the basic PDF invoice. Looks uh, you know pretty standard there. Uh, but then from here, when they click through, they can go ahead and pay the invoice. And from there, uh, they'll just put in their name, card number, expiration date, kind of the basic things, any comment they want to send you and submit their payment. Uh, and then essentially you'll have um, a record of any invoices that are outstanding or paid just from your main invoices tab here. So as you can see from here, uh, we've got some outstanding invoices um, that we sent uh, some of our, uh, our fake customers here. 
Um, so you'll be able to see if they viewed the invoice like we just did, but we didn't pay it. So if you can see that they've opened it but haven't uh, paid it yet, or you can see that it's been sent or hasn't been opened yet, or, or once it's paid, um, you'll see paid right here. So you can keep a, a, cl a quick, uh, close eye on any of the invoices you've sent. Um, you'll have access to, to pull reports based on any of the fields that you filled out in your invoices or in your uh, your basic transactions or your, your automatic payments. Um, and those reports can be uh, easily imported into QuickBooks or FreshBooks or any other kind of accounting software that you might use. Um, and we can create help you create custom reports as well that only pull the type of data that you want, or maybe it's only for your upcoming billing, or maybe it's only for your uh, you know, past billing, anything like that. Um, so uh, that's all I have for this. Uh, I wanted to quickly share with you a calendar link. I'll put this in the, um, put this in the chat here. Uh, but essentially, uh, if you wanted to uh, find some time on my calendar that works for you for a quick 10 minute phone call, we can uh, drill down into this. I can answer some more of your questions and we can find out uh, if we're able to save you some time and some money on your uh, payment processing by improving these processes, but also uh, just you know, offering you more competitive rates. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a few questions here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share uh, and answer a couple of the questions that we have. Yeah, and uh, Jared, maybe I'll, the first couple seem to be kind of related to the website stuff, and so Perfect. I can just answer those real quickly, and then the last couple, the last few seem to be related to kind of the, the payment stuff. So uh, one we got was about, you know, what kind of companies um, might be helpful for building a website if I don't want to do it myself, and at House Intelligence, we're actually offering um, some website uh, development, branding, and marketing services. So if that's something that's of interest um, of, you know, how might you outsource that? Uh, we're definitely um, a provider of that, looking to be, looking to expand that side of things. So um, if you're interested in talking more about what we can do for you, um, feel free to reach out to me at Zach at houseintelligence.io, which we'll share that as well in the follow-up, uh, the follow-up material. But um, yeah, we'd love to talk about how we can uh, kind of provide those services for you. And we're taking a different approach uh, than a traditional services model. Um, we really want to look at it as a long-term relationship. And so uh, we're looking at how to decrease the upfront costs and really kind of focus on longer term uh, ongoing relationships. So happy to talk more about that. Um, and then the, the other question we got was related to kind of the the standard elements and the standard um, best practices of what to put on your website. Like what are the, what are the baseline things that all website owners should have on their website? And I would say, you know, the baseline is definitely a homepage that clearly communicates what you're about, your value clearly has call to action that whatever you want your user, whatever you want your customers to do when they come to your website it needs to be evident that that's what you want them to do. And the best way to do that is with clear call to action buttons that tell them and that lead them through that journey. So you really want to think about your website as, you know, almost a yellow brick road where they start in Munchkin land and you want them to end up at the Emerald City, <laughs> which may be scheduling a, a appointment, which may be reaching out to you to talk more, which may be purchasing a product if you set up a, you know, set up an e-commerce site with something like a WooCommerce. Um, whatever it is that you want your customers and you want your visitors to the website to do, whatever that end outcome is or what we call a conversion, you really want to kind of reverse engineer, reverse engineer that back to, okay, I want them to land on this page, then I want them to take this action, then I want them to do this thing. And so I wouldn't say that there's necessarily like a one size fits all, but what I will say is that every website should be geared at driving customers to take the action that you want them to take. And you just kind of have to think about and play around and, and, um, iterate on the best way to accomplish that. But ultimately, you know, ultimately what your website is, is it's communicating your value to the visitor so that they take the action you want them to take and you engage with them the way that you want them to engage. So. 
Great, thanks, Zach. Uh, just a couple quick questions about gravity payments as a tool. Um, so Derek asked, is there a way to build gravity payments into my website? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really great question and something I probably should have touched on in the uh, kind of my core presentation, but uh, gravity payments can integrate directly with, with all of the top website building tools for e-commerce, um, including uh, WordPress, which we learned uh, a lot about uh, on this webinar. Uh, so our, our tool uh, can basically run in the back, back end. So if uh, you or, or Zach or your web developer are building a website that has a checkout or like a shopping cart feature, Gravity Payments can uh, process those credit card transactions at a cost that is far more competitive than uh, some, of the, uh, some of our competitors out there that also do that. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, we work with uh, really uh, all of the top uh, tools to integrate directly into your website. Um, and then the uh, other question we got here from Richard is, uh, Richard says, I've gotten a number of chargebacks in the past. Uh, how can Gravity help me avoid those? Yeah, so chargebacks are, are pretty tricky. Um, uh, essentially what you really want in order to uh, fight a chargeback, and for anyone who doesn't know what a chargeback is, that's when the cardholder basically goes to their bank or their credit card company and, and shows a uh, a charge and says, you know, I didn't actually make this charge, or maybe they say that the, um, the, 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 the merchant didn't really give me, you know, the service that they promised, they wouldn't give me a refund, anything like that. There's a variety of reasons like why this can happen. Um, but if the bank decides that uh, the, the transaction isn't legitimate, they will forcibly reverse the charge and that money will go back out of your account and into your, uh, your customer's account. And the way that you can fight that is just having a really good paper trail. So keeping your receipts, um, making the uh, terms and conditions and refund policy on your website really, really clear and uh, do the same thing in your invoices and your recurring billing. Um, make sure that you've sent them, you know, all the proper receipts and you keep a, a copy of that yourself. And if a chargeback does happen, we have tools where you get to be notified of it very, very quickly so that you can then respond in kind and hopefully, uh, you know, win that dispute. And, uh, you know, it does happen from time to time, even the most thoughtful, transparent, honest, uh, you know, high quality merchants sometimes receive chargebacks from their customers. Um, and it's our duty at Gravity Payments to give you the tools to help dispute those and to give you the guidance that you're going to need if that ever happens. Well, uh, we went a little bit over time. I want to uh, thank you folks for all st uh, sticking with us a little bit past the hour. Uh, I put a calendar link there in the chat if you wanted to click through that and find some time on my calendar to have a deeper conversation about your business and how Gravity might be able to save you on uh, your processing fees and kind of help you make uh, your, your processes a little more efficient and less time consuming for you. Uh, that's all we have for you. Uh, Zach and I would really like to thank you all for joining us and for uh, uh, answer, or asking great questions and uh, you know, joining us for this webinar. Uh, we'll be doing some more in the near future. Uh, please keep an eye out for uh, any of that communication from us. But I hope you have a great rest of your day and just thank you once again.